Well, half of you are still missing. I think uh, the Sunday was very intense <laughs> for many of you, but uh, still we have to go on with the program. So um, I would like to welcome you to the ninth edition of BCBT this year. And uh, you can, indeed, there are nine years we are uh, now um, welcoming students around the world that come here to, to join us to this wonderful school. And uh, you can find all the editions, you can visit uh, all the editions uh, here at, um, at the webpage of the school, um, where you can find as well uh, the information about the speakers and their lectures. Uh, this school, at uh, the ninth edition, was in the past um, supported uh, by the Convergent Science Network, a European project uh, that um, really fostered um, a new trend uh, in neuroscience and biotechnology and bio uh, mimetics and neurotechnology. By um, supporting uh, events like this, by supporting schools, uh, giving uh, scholarships to, like, to students to participate in large events uh, and, uh, and schools, conferences, uh, but also through um, the um, um, more social events like podcasts and video lectures and, and, and other social media. So if you have a chance, visit uh, this webpage if you need uh, more information. Um, this one, uh, the ninth edition, is a special edition uh, as we are uh, supported and we are collaborating with another European project, uh, which is the Socializing Sensory uh, Motor uh, Contingencies, the SOC CMC's EU project. And I invite you as well to, to look at uh, the meaning of this project, uh, which is um, the goal of which it's really to understand how uh, well, some of the goals, uh, to understand how um, we can not only understand um, socialization between humans, but especially between humans and, and robots, and all what it entails to understand uh, social behavior, uh, the neuroscientific level and uh, its implement rules and, and understanding and, at the, and the implementation at the robotics level. Uh, so, this year, the program committee um, is made by uh, Paul Verschur, that uh, you, will, you will hear from him uh, later, by Andreas Hengel uh, from um, the UK uh, University in Hamburg, and uh, that you will meet next week, uh, this week he couldn't be here, and, and myself. So, for anything that has to do with um, the school organization, you can refer to me, or for any administrative issues, you can directly go to Mireya Mora that you have met already via email and um, emailing with her. Um, so, in general, the aim of this school, uh, the school this year, is to bring together top of the line uh, scientists, and um, you, you will see throughout these two weeks. Um, to get a more a profound understanding of neural basis of cognition and social interaction, as well as socializing sensory uh, motor contingencies. And we will do this uh, in these two weeks with um, uh, very interesting lectures. And I have here a list, but I will not go through the list. Just um, uh, take a look at the program. You have it in... Uh, uh, on the web, and you have it uh, on a printed format. If there is anything that, according to you, is not correct in the program, please let me know, but don't be stuck on it. Uh, sometimes, you know, <laughs> printed stuff can uh, eventually change in real, uh, in real uh, life, in real time. So um, this year, uh, we will have uh, lectures uh, during the two weeks in the morning at 10 o'clock every day. Uh, every time, I think the first edition in 2008, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning. Until this year, we decided to start at 10 o'clock to give space, but I see that it's not enough. <laughs> so <laughs> what are we going to do? We must have a, a meeting uh, about this, how to start, what time to start, at what time to start the lectures. Um, 
So every day in the morning, uh, then at 10 o'clock. Then we, uh, today we will have a poster session to allow you to uh, discuss and, and your, your research and, and to get to know uh, each other. Of course, we will also have projects because BCPT is project oriented. And in the afternoon, uh, you will uh, start after lunch at 15.30 to uh, work on projects. Uh, later this afternoon, uh, starting at uh, 3.30, in fact, after lunch, we will have a session here, so please come back here, to discuss on the projects and to see how uh, the students will uh, embrace the different type of projects and who is going to supervise uh, the projects. So um, here you see um, it says uh, performance. Um, we will say something about that uh, as well later on. But it's not just work, uh, BCBT is also fun, and we will have social events. Uh, for instance, tomorrow uh, we will have a little apero, a cocktail, uh, in a beautiful terrace in one of the uh, written buildings here in this uh, uh, very modern district. We will have a barbecue at the end of the week. Uh, you will be informed anyway as the school goes, and it's also in the program. And fi finally, we'll have the farewell dinner, and I leave the farewell dinner description to Paul because he loves to tell you something that normally happens in the f during the farewell dinner. I will not advance anything about that. And yeah, the performance, uh, just a few words. Uh, the word performance already set you up for who knows what, something maybe along the line. We're dealing with robots and maybe dance, but it's not gonna be like that. Uh, or in fact, like that. Uh, it's gonna be something not even like that. It's going to be something more interesting, more avant-garde, something that you eventually will be part of uh, and that we can build all together. All the projects that you will be working on will be somehow implemented together to give a form to a live performance that will be delivered at the end of the second week, the very last day of the school. We will um, produce this beautiful integration, human, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, who knows what else. Um, and here, well, I don't want to anticipate too much, but we have an idea already about what it, this performance uh, should be uh, structured, um, how it should be structured, and what should be um, what sh what should be delivered to the to the audience. There will be an audience, maybe, maybe not. It depends how ready we are to perform. So. Um, then we switch uh, page, and I invite you to uh, watch or see the previous lectures of BCBT. Uh, we have like uh, 80 lectures or even more in a YouTube channel. Some needs, um, some are open. Some uh, may need some uh, a password, and this can be provided if if it is requested, as well as you can go and listen to our. Um, BCBT uh, podcast interview, sorry. Um, and this is the channel. I think you have this information in your program as well, certainly in the, in the BCBT webpage. And of course, if you like tweeting, uh, please tweet about the school and what interests you uh, in the lectures and about your colleagues and so. So now, so use the hashtag BCBT16, uh, I think, yeah. BCBT 16. So now something very practical about uh, what you're going to do this afternoon, so, um, or it, during the afternoons. Uh, there is a computer room available uh, also to give tutorial if anyone wants to follow tutorials. Uh, and it's just across the, the square. The information is in your um, program. It's room 54003. Uh, computers with some software will be available. Lunch is all together at 1.30, so please follow the crowd and it will be in a nice uh, fresh uh, tunnel and will be a buffet, so it, it's gonna be nice. <laughs> uh, so don't take off from camp, stay in, on, on the campus and go to lunch. 
And here uh, for the podcast interviews, we will have a sound studio for who dares to have this sound, uh, these interviews. Um, well, I will leave this for another day. Um, but today, well, here this afternoon, we will have again uh, the project presentation. And now we will take off, we will kickstart this uh, BCBT program with uh, the morning talk uh, from Professor Semid Zeki. Uh, they will talk to us about how our brain deal with the vision, with visual, with what we, all the strategies that we need uh, to see the world the way, the way we see we, we see it, and later the process session. So then welcome again, and I leave the stage to Paul, and Paul Bershaw that will introduce Professor Semi. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. To, uh, to BCBT. You need it? Uh, no, I need that. Okay. Um, with my, my computer. Uh, so two things. Um, Here in case. So yeah, we started BCBT so nine years ago um, with, the, with the whole idea of building a community that can sort of, in a very integrated way, cross between science, technology, and, and art because we feel that for the future of, of both brain science and technology, this kind of multidisciplinary orientation is sort of key. And um, we have um, been rather successful with, with that, in, in both in terms of, of advancing this Living Machines, the Living Machines Conference, uh, and the BCBT uh, Summer School. And um, so now, this year, we want to do something somewhat different. Okay, so um, every year, uh, the concept is morning lectures where we look at science and then afternoon we go to do practical work because we believe you know to advance science advance our understanding is not a matter of just talking to each other and, uh, and appearing very smart it's also about doing stuff with it so the science has a very pragmatic side to it as well which we don't want to push through our project so that that means that people would do in small groups projects and there would be a project presentation at the end but this year we want to do this uh, somewhat differently because we thought, well, maybe um, what we can try to do is now have all the sub-projects that also Anna will describe uh, later that we will discuss in the afternoon, let them all fit together in, in one sort of integrated piece. And that piece will be the performance that we will largely do for ourselves. So there's nothing to be embarrassed about if things go wrong. Um, so to also link a bit more our ideas about science and technology to art and to different forms of artistic expression. And this is also a theme that then relates strongly to the European project uh, SOC SMCs, which is then also one of the main sponsors of the project that you might hear more about later. So now art is not anything to be afraid of, right? This is, this is important now. Moreover, it's also not like hand wavy or wishy-washy, to the contrary. Now you visit someone's laboratory, right? An established researcher, and it will give you a demo. Nothing works. So oh, it's a demo effect. And we accept that from each other as scientists. We think that's normal. If as an artist you give a performance, stuff has to work. You cannot stand on stage and wave your hands and say, oh, it's a demo effect, right? So actually, by aiming for performance, we also are increasing the bar of the reliability of our own technologies and ideas. Okay, so art is actually also a real challenge for the perspective for science. Ideas are cheap. Getting it done is hard. Right? So everything is easy for the person who doesn't have to do it. Another way to look at this. Yeah? So to so actually translate our ideas in a concrete performance will give us mileage because we have to really, if you want to put our activities and our money where our mouth is. And that's something that many scientists are not used to. All right? So in that sense, I think, um, in addition to that, of course, art invites us to enter somewhat different domains, to, to open our minds more to the implications of our ideas and to be more exploratory. Right? We don't really, really need to worry continuously about the controllability of our experiments. We can also just explore and look at these phenomena that we will be synthesizing. All right? So there's this big invitation about the art. And th so this is a little bit about the project. This will be great fun. Uh, aspects as a research group, we have been engaged in this since the late 90s, and certainly for our scientists, has given us enormous mileage. 
and also the real world is profiting for this. For instance, our rehabilitation gaming system is a stroke rehabilitation system that has been serving the needs of over 600 stroke patients now uh, across the world. Um, actually arose really from committing our ideas and our research to artistic expression. This opened our mind to new applications of these ideas, right? So there's a lot to be learned. Now, that's one part of our, of our outlook. So let's be ambitious. The second one is someone will go home with this amazing model of the Taj Mahal. It smells a bit odd though, but okay. And, and now this is an amazing uh, award that we um, hand out every year to the winner of our uh, BCBT uh, Vision Song Contest. All right, so what's the idea of the, of the BCBT Vision Song Contest? Um, uh, so it is indeed related to our notion of artistic expression. So, but here you, um, you have our uh, score sheets of last year. So everybody has to pull out their passport and look at the country name listed on your passport. And if your passport looks the same with the same country name, you're friends. All right, and you're gonna take one song from your country that you're gonna prepare so well that when you're gonna perform it at a farewell dinner, you can go home with our moment of the Taj Mahal. All right, so this is the BCBT Song Festival. Um, and everybody, uh, this, this, is, this is not uh, optional, it's mandatory. Um, so you have to, um, let me see. So last year, uh, let me see what happened last year. Lots of stuff happened last year, oh, I don't know. Um, let me see if I have a winner somewhere. Ah, yeah, this was the amazing performance of the Dutch team. Oh, but then we need sound. Well, it's not happening, it looks like, is it? All right, well, I will play that for you then some other time. Anyway, we have some amazingly talented people in the room every year. So don't underestimate your own talents. Uh, team up with your, with your friends from the same country. Although given these populist ten, uh, tendencies in Europe, maybe we should force you to team up with people from other countries, but okay, that's something for next year. Um, this is your main objective of these two weeks. Everything else is secondary, okay? You all have to have the ambition and drive to win the BCBT Song Contest, all right? Okay, so let's see in two weeks who's gonna do it. Um, so th that's a bit the uh, introductory remarks from my side, so now let's, let's get back to our um, to our science uh, program. So it's a great honor for, for BCBT and for, for myself to introduce uh, Sammy Uzeki um, as our opening speaker for the for this summer school. So Sammy Uzeki is the, um, let me see, what was the name of the, of the, the, the chair? The Henry Head Research Fellow of Henry the Royal Society. No, we'll mix everything up. No. 200 years ago. <laughs> that was 200 years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, so let's, let's start simple. Aesthetics. That's right. But, uh, but look, S Samir started his research career really investigating vision. Okay, and there he made really important contributions early on, but we're talking 80s and 90s, right? These are the 200 years ago. In looking at, at really deep, challenging questions in vision, like color vision, and in particular, how integration is, is a key feature of a visual system. It's not necessarily a local feature in brains, is a feature that comes from a system property in brains. But then Samir went one step further, and that's also why now he's professor of neuroaesthetics, because he now started to challenge, or he went for even bigger challenges, which is how do we then account for experience if we have an understanding of how the physiology of the system might work? So how can we think about aesthetics from now this perspective of neurophysiology, which of course is raising very deeply um, the open questions that, that still await answers. Similar, uh, Professor Zeki has made great progress in answering some of these questions about, let's say, these epistemic or aesthetic emotions and how we can link them to perceptual experience. And I hope he's gonna share some of that with us today. But in addition, he also has translated some of these ideas in exhibitions that he has been um, devising himself. Uh, I saw one of the exhibitions in, in Italy, right? Um, so let me say we really try to also step in a very concrete way from the lab, from the neurophysiology to this challenging area of human experience and art. And I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot 
from its insights today. So welcome to BCBT. Thank you very much for joining us and looking forward to your talk. As Samir is setting up, I'll, setting up, well, I found an interesting quote by him. Um, well, there are many interesting quotes by him, but one that I wanted to share with you is, what is creative in this is the seeking of perfection and not attaining it. So let's see <laughs> how much perfection you have attained in your own work. I think uh, I adapted that from Michelangelo, who says, tragedy does not lie in aiming high and not achieving it, but in aiming low and achieving it. <laughs> uh, so how do I do that? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair Lady, and thank you, Paul, for your introductions, and thank you all for turning up. I must say, if I were you, I would not have turned up, but anyway. Um, I appreciated your uh, introduction very much uh, about uh, the uh, combining art and science, but I, I just want to give a word of warning about that. This is a political word of warning. I wasn't thinking of doing it, but I think I'd better do it. The current buzzword is interdisciplinarity. But when you look at it carefully, what people mean, what these scientific organizations and, and scientific journals mean by interdisciplinarity are things such as neuroanatomy and neuropathology, or neurophysiology and neuropharmacology. Try to approach them with a question such as, which would, would unite philosophical speculations or artistic achievements with study of neurophysiology, and they will recoil in horror. Try to tell them that the questions that the cubists were asking about how does a form maintain its identity in spite of different viewing conditions is identical to the question that neurophysiologists ask, which is how does, uh, what is constitutes, what are the neural mechanisms that underlie form constancy, and they will not see the light. They will not see the, the point at all. Try to tell them <coughs> that one can learn a great deal from the output of Cezanne because one of the questions that he was asking is, was, how does color modulate form? Which is a variant of the question that neurophysiologists ask today. How does color interact with form? Because they've got two separate representations in the brain. And I think the most lamentable advice, the most lamentable advice I have read which appeared in the past three months from an academy in England, is that go for interdisciplinarity, but lie low for many years until you master one discipline before you go into another. Nowhere is there a question there of saying, settle on the question that you want, and then take any technique that you need, any discipline that you need to answer that question. This is a really sad day for um, for academic research. And I think if you look at the interdisciplinarity, you should equally look at other organizations outside the academic world, things like Microsoft and Google and people like that, who actually see value, financial value, and therefore support it. So with that preamble, let me say that today I'm going to be talking not about aesthetics or about neuroaesthetics, but about the organization of the visual brain. I have a new picture of the organization of the visual brain, but this does not mean to say that we throw the old picture out at all. Rather, we incorporate what we have found with such meticulous research over the past 50, 60 years into a new system of how the visual brain operates. I have had to cut out a lot of details because it's quite complicated, so I'll just go to to the bare bones, but we can have 
a, a discussion later on. So the <coughs> excuse me. So the study of the visual brain really started in the 1860s under Salomon Henschen in Sweden. He did it by looking at patients with uh, lesions in their cortex. And he found that the visible uh, radiations, this, a, yeah, the visual, uh, the retina projects through the visual radiations to a part of the brain known as the primary visual cortex located in the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. And since then, so this was thought to be the primary visual cortex, he called it the cortical retina, with which you saw the visual image, and the cortex lying outside was vaguely referred to as visual association cortex, with which you interpreted what you saw in the light of present and past experience. Now, a lot has happened in vision since 1867. A lot of very brilliant work, meticulous work, which has changed our view of how the visual brain organi is organized very, very markedly. But of, there is one thing which has remained and it has not had a good effect. The notion that has remained is what Paul Fexig called, uh, described as, uh, as follows. He said, we become more and more convinced that the primary visual cortex is the sole entering place of the visual radiation into the organ of psyche. And therein, in that assumption, in that belief, lies a cardinal mistake that people have made, not in the results that they have accumulated, but in the, in the interpretation that they have given to these results. And you must understand that the interpretation is, of course, a critical part of the uh, scientific process. Now, the reason for this is partly or for, the, for supposing that the primary visual cortex is the only entering place into the rest of the visual brain lies partly in the fact that lesions to the primary visual cortex cause blindnesses, the extent uh, of the blindness and its position being directly related to the extent and size of the lesion. So you, with a very small lesion in the visual cortex, you have a scotoma, larger one, a, a quadrantinopia, and if the entire visual cortex on one side is gone, you have a contralateral hemianopia. So this seemed natural, since you get complete blindness, to suppose that this was the area which was the cortical retina, as Henschen called it. And at that time, there was only indifferent evidence to show that lesions in other parts of the brain lead to other kinds of visual defects. Another reason for supposing that the primary visual cortex was distinct and separate is lies in the cytoarchitecture. This is the boundary of the primary visual cortex stained for nissel substance, and you, for, which, which basically means stained for RNA. Uh, you can see that you can draw a sharp boundary. And this was at a time, you must remember, when physiological differences, functional differences between areas were supposed to be reflected in anatomical differences. And here was one area which had a distinct anatomical architecture and another area in front which did not have a distinct, which was uniform. So for these two reasons, among others, but these were the main two reasons, this was the visual, uh, uh, primary visual cortex, the only entering place of the visual radiation into the organ of psyche, and this was the visual association cortex. And signals were supposed to be flow flowing from the retina to the LGN to V1 to visual association cortex in hierarchical fashion. By hierarchy, what I mean is a succession of stations through which the uh, visual signals flow. In the 1970s, I performed a series of experiments to study the uh, how every point of the primary visual cortex connects with the visual association cortex in front. So all the information contained in a particular part of the field of view projects to a corresponding part of the retina, which then goes to a point in the cortex. By a point in the cortex, I mean one millimeter uh, square. 
This is one degree square, one millimeter square. And found, we found that each point here has got multiple outputs to the different parts of this visual association cortex. Now, if you require to use a bit of logic here, it is difficult to suppose that the primary visual cortex will be sending the same signals to different parts of the visual association cortex in these different uh, anatomically distinct pathways. So it's more reasonable to suppose that it sends different signals. And if it sends different signals, then the, this cannot be a uniform area in spite of its uniform cytoarchitecture, but must be made of several distinct areas. So here are the connections. So we've got, and by the way, these differ in their fiber calibers and other characteristics and their density. So there's no doubt that they are separate anatomical pathways. And this has now been shown many times since. So this area here, which used to be considered to be a single visual association cortex, turns out to be made up of several distinct visual areas, each with its distinct anatomical input. There's another area here, area V5, um, th thus showing that there are multiple visual areas in the brain. At the same time, if I may go back to the slide, now, not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago, not 30 years ago, not 40 years ago, but in 1969, 1969, Brian Craig showed that each one of these areas receives an input from the pulvinar, and in 1980, Yukie and Evi showed that the LGN and Fries, uh, Wolfgang Fries showed that the LGN projects to all these areas. So, the LGN projects to V1, yes, that's the classical pathway, but the LGN projects to all of these areas as well. The pulvinar also projects to V1 and all of these visual areas as well. And therefore, uh, of course, on top of that, you've got V1, as I told you, having parallel outputs to these areas. Therefore, one of the fundamental beliefs in the visual system which you will find uniformly in every single paper written about the visual form system and in every single paper written about the visual color system and in most but not all papers written about the visual motion system. That's beginning to change remarkably. This belief that there is only one feed-forward system into the visual brain and it is through, through V1 is simply not true. And I believe that all interpretations of... Oh, Oh. Account, what is my account number? Uh, I believe all of these uh, interpretations will have to be modified in the future. Now, let me just be clear about what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the results are wrong. Uh, people recording from pre stride cortex, uh, finding certain properties, etc. I'm not saying these are wrong. But the interpretations that it all starts in V1 certainly has got to be revisited. Now, if we go back to the, the, uh, these multiple outputs, as I told you, the, it is difficult to suppose that the brain will send the same signals, It'll, but it's much more logical to suppose it will send different signals to these different areas, from which it would follow that they do different things. And one, uh, I'll summarize the evidence for that in this slide which is a, a slide, uh, a reconstruction of an experiment in which people look at a multicolored uh, uh, scene with no recognizable object, a so-called land-colored Mondrian. And they also look at a pattern of black and white dots in motion. And you look at the activity in the brain when uh, people look at these two different stimuli. You find that when they look at this, you have activity in V1 and in the region here called V4. And when you look at this, you have activity in V5, but also in V1. So V1 is indeed a sort of a entering place to the rest of the brain, but it is not the only entering place. Let me just say on the question of imaging studies, as you know, imaging studies have come in for a fair degree of criticism recently on the basis of probabilities. Um, I think that these results are not subject to this skepticism because they have been repeated so many times by so many different laboratories since we described them in the 80s. 
but I also think that when you go into the problem of probabilities and statistics, you should actually perhaps uh, adopt also a really rather Bayesian approach in the sense that belief must come into it as well. Belief must be factored into your working out of probabilities. And I think this is something, when you go by a uh, neat statistical method and uh, 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 oh, forget about belief, then you are probably going to be in trouble. Now, I'd like to tell you a story about this particular result. Um, the uh, evidence that there was uh, activity in V4 when you stimulate with color was based on six patients. And it was published, wait for it, it was published in Nature. Now, my colleagues were very uh, reluctant to, to, to send this off, but I was their boss, so I had the final say. What gave me confidence to publish this, which has, as I say, been, been, been uh, repeated many times since, it was that lesions in this area caused the syndrome of cerebral achromatopsia. So that was the belief which also had to be factored in the final interpretation of the result, regardless of the p-values. Now, so to go back then, you've got these different areas doing different things. But it has been an assumption in visual physiology that we see all the different attributes of the visual scene at the same precise moment and in precise registration. And that is because our common experience is when we look at a car which is red, we see its form, its direction of motion, and its color at the same time. So it makes natural sense. So the question is, <coughs> do visual signals always reach V1 first? We are here, you see, we, the, the assumption is that you have got an input from the retina to the LGN to V1, this is the old system, to V3, V4, V5, and other areas. And if you study the uh, latency of the arrival of signals, I don't mean the mean latency, which is what people have concentrated on, but the earliest latencies, which is a different proposition, you find that this is not true. So if you take the motion system, uh, which is, uh, this is a result which was published in 1995, but has been replicated many times since, um, and that's why the motion system is now a bit more advanced than the others. So if you stimulate with fast motion, you find that the signals, let me see, I get always lost here, uh, with, with fast motion shown with, in red, the signal latency occurs first in V5, the motion area, and then in V1, first in, sorry, where am I? Um, I'm getting lost here. Yes, first in V5 here, whereas with the, am I getting this right? V1, V5, and then in V1. Oh, dear. oh no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've got it. Uh, the, with fast signal, the, the motion peaks first in V1, and then in V5, uh, so, sorry, well, first in V5, mo the motion area, and then in V1, whereas with slow-moving signals, it peaks first in V1, okay, and then in V5. The difference between the two being about 40 to 50 milliseconds, okay. So, in summary then, signals reach V5 first, and they reach V1 later. Now, this depends upon the speed of the moving stimuli. If you have a fast moving stimuli, by which I mean a stimulus that moves above 22 degrees per second, then V5 is active first. If you have a slowly moving stimulus, this, I mean to say about two degrees per second, then signals reach V1 first. So it turns out then that the notion that all signals reach V1 first, which is published in the literature in long reviews, 
is based on mean latencies. If you look at the earliest latencies, even in those papers, you'll find that they pick up signals at 20 milliseconds. So you've got two pathways distinguished by the um, uh, speed of conduction, a fast pathway to V5, which actually bypasses V1, which I'll show you in a moment, which reaches V5 at 30 milliseconds, and a slow pathway which reaches V1 and then V5, and reaches V5 at 60 milliseconds after stimulus onset. All right? So the notion that signals must always pass through V1 first before reaching the other areas is simply not true. And I can assert that statement uh, with, 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 with confidence because this has been now repeated so many times, including in the past, the uh, last one being in the past year. So the visual signals reach visual areas asynchronously depending upon the task. If you ask is to look at the, at a, at a, depending upon the stimulus, I should say, really, if, it, if the stimulus is fast moving, you pick up signals in V5 first. The stimulus is slow moving, you pick it up in V1 first. So what we have here is the three, three feet forward input into the visual brain, not one, as is emphasized in most of the published literature even appearing today, but three. And by the way, my authority for saying this is anatomical, is indisputable, it's been there for 50 years, and it's not me. So you've got the retina, LGN, to all of these areas. You've got the retina, pulmonar to all of these areas. All right? Plus you've got, of course, the retina, LGN, V1, and then the connections to these areas. So if you have fast motion, here's your system, you've got fast motion, you've got V5 active first, and then V1. And if you've got slow motion, you've got V1 active first, and then V5. Hence, there are two parallel hierarchies reaching V5, but which one has got precedence over the other depends upon the stimulus. Hence, the latencies with which signals arrive in an area are stimulus dependent. So, visual signals can also reach V1 and the specialized areas within the same time window. I've shown you one example in which signals reach a specialized visual area V5 first, depending upon the stimulus. Now, I'm going to show you that with many other stimuli, signals reach V1 and the specialized areas more or less simultaneously. So if you take the classical uh, experiment, and this is, there's a, there's a big uh, important issue here. It is, assumed, it is assumed by most people who work on form that forms are elaborated from the orientation selective cells of V1 that Hubel and Weasel described in, first in 1959. For those of you who do not know, orientation selective cells are cells which respond to the line of one orientation and do not respond to the orthogonal orientation. And they're supposed to be the building blocks for form orientation. Incidentally, if you want to combine science and art, Mondrian also thought that the oriented straight line is the building blocks of all forms. His definition, Mondrian's definition of form, was the plurality of straight lines in rectangular opposition. And both artists and scientists believe that uh, orientation selective cells are the building blocks of form. I happen to think that they are both wrong. But never mind. So if you take then um, oriented lines and simulate the nasal quadrant of subjects and register the ac brain activity, the latency in brain activity with magnetoencephalography, which measures the magnetic current, and also use other stimuli which are so-called more complex building, uh, more complex result of building block uh, strategy, so uh, rectangles and rhombuses you will find <coughs> that the areas V1, V2, V3 are all stimulated uh, equally by rhomboids and by lines, and there is a peak activity at uh, between 30 and 40 milliseconds. Uh, it took us a great deal of work to establish this because this deflection here 
is equivalent to about 50 femtel teslas, which translated in the number of cells that are active means about 50,000 cells. But if you want to talk about the number of cells, we can talk about perhaps later. And it turns out that it is not lines that are the most effective in driving the cells in these areas, but it is the angles. And rhombuses are the least effective. So these are the areas which are activated, and these are the strengths of activity in these different areas. So this begins to cast doubt uh, about the fact that the oriented lines are the building blocks, or they are the only building blocks of forms. They are important. I do not question this. They're extremely important in, in uh, form vision. But maybe there are other strategies that are also involved. One of the, one of the uh, sayings that people usually uh, mouth when talking about form is, is the Gestalt school, that the, that the uh, complex forms are more than the sum of the parts. But the Gestalt people did not say that. They said that complex forms are other than the sum of the parts. There's a big difference there. And it is interesting to consider whether these uh, activities in these areas are not also influenced by the direct input to them from the lateral genetic nucleus and the pulvinar, in addition to the activity that uh, to the signals that they receive from the orientation selective cells in V1. Now, a big, a big uh, area of research at the moment is object and face discrimination. And again, assuming that they are universally, without exception, I don't claim to have read every single paper on face and object vision, but I've read a considerable number. And without exception, they all suppose that the properties of cells in face and house areas are built from the orientation selective cells of V1. So we can construct houses, uh, faces and houses from orientation selective cells. Subjects find it very easy to distinguish between these stimuli as if whether they are faces or houses, although they are built of the same lines with the same length and the same orientation. And again, if you uh, expose subjects to these stimuli, and uh, stimulating one half. The, the, there are technical reasons for stimulating only one half of the vis visual field. And we can come to that in discussion if you want to. You will find that, again, you have a deflection at between uh, uh, 30 and 40 milliseconds to both faces and houses. And the deflection uh, uh, can be traced to activity in the primary visual cortex, as well as to activity in the fusiform face area and the hippocampal place area. So all these areas receive an input from the primary visual cortex, but also do receive direct input from the lateral genetic nucleus and the pulvinar, which bypass the primary visual cortex. And it seems to me that it is unreasonable to suppose that these direct inputs to these areas, which bypass V1, are simply impotent. I think it's much more reasonable to suppose that they play an active role in uh, perception. And I think I'm going to show you some evidence in favor of that. Again, with color, so if you have subjects fixating across and you've got two gray squares changed from red to gray or gray to red, red to blue, uh, and gray to blue, again, you're using magnetoencephalography to, de to detect the earliest signals there's no doubt about late signals. We're all happy about that. We're all happy about mean signals. But you're looking at the earliest, latency of the earliest signals. You find that it occurs again at about 30 to uh, uh, 40 milliseconds. And also, what's very interesting is that the direction of the magnetic current is different with red and green stimuli, implying that cells are grouped differently. So the evidence for this is, again, pretty tight. Hence, let me summarize this, this point. There are multiple visual areas in the brain. They all receive input from area V1. That's correct, and we should retain that. But they also all receive input from the lateral genetic nucleus and the pulvinar. That's a, not a new finding. It is 50 years old, but it has not been incorporated. And thirdly, 
Visible signals do not necessarily reach V1 first. They either reach all these visible areas simultaneously or reach visible areas of the pre-strike cortex before V1, depending upon the stimulus and also upon the task. These are new findings which should be incorporated into the um, uh, new body of mod how we model the visible brain. Now, the next question is, do we perceive different visible attributes at the same precise time? So this is an interesting question because we've got signals reaching the V1 and the pre-stride visual areas either at the same simultaneous time or reaching the pre-stride visual areas before. So do we perceive everything at the same time? It is incredible. It is incredible that we have always made this assumption without ever testing it. And uh, Constantinos Mutusas and I, Constantinos is a Greek student of mine, he, he no longer, he's a, he's a uh, grown up man now, um, uh, were interested in, to work on binding of how you bring everything together. And we were puzzled by why after 25, 30 years of work on binding, there had been no real answer. Nobody, even today, can tell you how binding occurs. How do you bring the activity in different visual areas, which process different attributes of the visual scene together to give you your uniform integrated uh, uh, perception of an object, which occurs after 150 milliseconds. So the question that we ask is, is it true that we perceive everything at the same time? And the answer uh, is obtained after doing experiments which are roughly like this. You can, there are lots of variants of these, and these were it's now almost 20 years old. Uh, so you have got a pendulum that moves back and forth rather more quickly than this. And it changes its color as it moves back and forth. The task for the subject is to tell you what color it was when it was moving to the right, or what color it was when it was moving to the right, to the left, or what was the direction of the motion when the color was green or the color was red. And if you do that experiment, you find that it is not true that we see color uh, and orientation and uh, motion at the same time. In fact, we see color before we see motion by 80 milliseconds. Now, 80 milliseconds is a very long time. Well, not in real time, so there are 1,000 milliseconds in a second. But in terms of physiological time, it's very long because it takes half to one millisecond uh, for the impulse to cross from one cell to the next. If you do this experiment on orientation, so that you have a cell, you have a stimulus which is at this orientation or this orientation and changes color, you will find that we see color before we see the oriented line, um, the orientation of the line rather, at uh, 40 milliseconds before. So you've got a hierarchy in terms of perception. So what works in the macro world over 150 milliseconds does not occur in the micro world. And in a sense, this is not dissimilar, in a sense, to the division between gravitational physics and quantum mechanics. You cannot predict the rules of quantum mechanics from gravitational physics, and you cannot predict the rules of gravitational physics from quantum mechanics. This has been the problem which has besieged physicists for the past 150 years, and all sorts of theories are coming up in string theory and quantum gravitation and much else besides. But till today, it has not been resolved. And our problem is, of course, very different in the field of perception, but it is to reconcile why it is that the rules that obtain in the macro world of time over 150 milliseconds, when we do see everything in precise spatial temporal registration, does not occur in the micro world below 150 milliseconds when we see different things at different times. I think there are very good evolutionary reasons for this, which we can talk about later. Now, the consequence of this is this, that if what happens is you bind the, the color that you saw at time zero with the motion that you had seen at minus 80 milliseconds, Therefore, you misbind. Therefore, there is no brain area which waits for these different areas to terminate their tasks. All right? So this is a rather important thing which has to be factored in 
And it has not, it has not, but it, it'll come. So the brain then is operating asynchronously. And let me just tell you that computer scientists are today struggling to achieve asynchronous computers. In the current computers that we have are synchronous. And so they've got clocks. The asynchronous computers which they are striving to achieve are ones in which the fastest system does not have to wait for the slowest system to complete its task. And so far, they have failed to achieve what the brain has achieved in terms of evolution. Or at least if they have, it has been a, with only a minimal success. These differences in perceptual times are almost certainly due to differences in processing times. And you can show this by this. There are many experiments, but I'm just going to concentrate on one. If you have, uh, if you want to pair up and down motion with left and right motion, so you ask the subject, what was the motion to the right? What direction was the motion to the right when the, when the direction of motion on the left was upward? You will get zero difference. So they will see them at the same time. But if you make this stimulus equiluminant, let's say uh, the, 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 uh, there is no difference in luminance between here and the surround, whereas there's a big difference here. And we know from the work of Saito and others in Japan that equiluminant stimuli are less effective in driving the cells of V5, and they're also more sluggish. You'll find that this up and down motion of luminous uh, stimulus will have a precedence of about 40 to 50 milliseconds over this one, which is equiluminant. So this is quite, you get a picture here which is quite unlike the picture that you get from here. If you go back to having both sides uh, equi uh, equiluminant, then there's zero difference. And if you have them both luminant, then you've got zero difference. And there are other experiments which have shown that it's almost certain that these differences in perceptual times can be related to differences in processing times. Now, so let me just summarize for you what I have said so far, because I want to move to a slightly different topic. What I've said so far is that there are multiple visual areas in the brain. There are feed-forward systems to all of them. There's, it is not true that there's only one feed-forward system which delivers signals to them through V1. Instead, they all receive signals directly from the lateral nucleus, directly from the pulvinar, and directly from V1. And that these different uh, visual areas undertake their operations asynchronously, with the consequence that there is an asynchrony in visual perception in the micro scale, but not in the macro scale. Micro scale, I mean less than 150 milliseconds after stimulus onset, and macro scale means 150 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Consequently, <clears throat> it is not true that consciousness is unified or that consciousness depends upon binding, because here you're misbinding. Um, uh, there are instead many micro consciousnesses which are distributed in space and in time. Why do I say this? Because uh, the perception of motion is based on V5. If V5 is damaged, you do not perceive fast motion. Perception of color is due to activity in a different geographically distinct area, V4, and therefore perception being conscious perception is distributed in space. You perceive color before you, see, you perceive motion, therefore consciousness is distributed in time, which leaves, again, we are now dealing in the micro world, which leaves out of account the question of how you bring them together over in the macro world. So given that there is an input, direct input to these visual areas that bypasses V1, we can ask the question, can the feed-forward input that bypasses V1 to reach these specialized visual areas directly result in a conscious, if crude, visual percept? And the answer is yes. The evidence for this is derived. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is saying that V1 has been sure. So we're looking at a situation in which uh, V1 is no longer active, but the input to the other areas are. And this happens in a case of uh, lesion, which is confined largely to V1. And the most famous subject there is a subject called GY, studied uh, by Larry Weisskranz and his colleagues at Oxford. But they reached the wrong conclusion, and they have changed their mind now. The 
fact is that if you take this chap suffered from uh, uh, damage to V1, shown here, massive damage, but sparing the occipital pole and hence sparing for veal vision. This is his blind area in the, in the contralateral side. He, uh, it was sustained in a car accident at the age of seven, and we studied him at the age of about 32, so it would be quite mature. Um, the, if you stimulate the blind field with fast motion, moving in different directions, he is aware of the presence of a stimulus, and he is aware of the direction of motion in the sense that he can report it. If you stimulate it with slow motion, he is neither aware nor can report it. And this takes me back to a much ignored paper. Indeed, I think that I'm the only person who referred to it in the first place years ago by Riddick. Riddick was a, a, a surgeon in the uh, British Army during the Great War. And he studied patients who had been repatriated to England after suffering damage from enemy fire, uh, which had wounded the occipital cortex. And he found that these subjects, when studied uh, with, with these stimuli, um, uh, they could not detect static parametric studies. They could not detect uh, uh, stationary stimuli, but they could detect moving stimuli. And he mentioned the word conscious five times in his article, he says, they were, and I'm quoting, they were only conscious of the moving stimulus. They could assign neither form nor color to it, so vague and shadowy it was. And if you ask GY, uh, which I have, what does he see, how does he see the motion? He says, well, you look, close your eyes, look at the sun, and move your hand in front, and that's what I see. It's very shadowy. And the blind side people have now revised, the, uh, well, they called it type 1, type 2, but now they've admitted that you can get conscious vision in the blind field. So the direct input to V5, which bypasses V1, can mediate a crude but conscious experience of vision. All right? And it turns out that this is also true for color. Keith Ruddock and uh, Chris Kennard at Oxford have shown that if you take patients blinded by lesions in V1, you, they can report the color of the stimulus correctly when, when uh, the stimulus is presented in their blind field, provided the stimuli are large. So that these inputs play some role, and these, uh, they can report it consciously. Now, there are other studies which also show that if you project lines of different orientation in the blind field, such subjects can discriminate orientations, but it is not clear from their reports whether they were conscious or not of having seen it. So that settles the question that there is a role that these uh, projections, which bypass V1 and go straight to the prescribed visual areas, specialized areas, play. Um, and if you, if you take subject GY and show him fast motion, you get activity in V5 there, and if you show him slow motion, there is no activity there. He's conscious of this, and there he gets, he's neither conscious nor can he discriminate it uh, correctly. And now I'll show you something uh, which, um, this is uh, uh, Isia Levian's um, uh, Enigma stimulus. If you fixate the center, some of you, not all of you will see rapid motion in the rings. Do I have any takers? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, now this is rapid motion and it reverses direction with prolonged viewing. And if you take people who see this rapid motion and put them in the scanner and give them the stimulus, you find that there is activity in V5 without activity in V1. If you give them slow motion, you get activity both in V1 and V5. At the time we did this experiment, it was 1993, I had not quite worked out the fast input to V5, and therefore did not interpret it in that way. The papers on fast motion to V5 were published in 1995, so two years after this. Now, let's go back then to this um, uh, uh, critical diagram that the, there are three feet forward input to V1 and to specialized visual areas. But having accepted this anatomical fact, which is indisputable, let us not make the error 
of throwing away all the good things that have been collected about the visual brain. The, the idea of hierarchical organization of the visual brain, which uh, uh, Hubel and Weasel emphasized, but which they have changed, which Hubel and Livingston changed their mind on in the light of these discoveries, is derived from a number of facts. One is that this receptive field of cells, that's say the part of the visual field, which when stimulated results in a reaction from the cell, increases in size. So there's a hierarchy in size as you go from V1 to areas in the prestriated visual cortex. There's also the, 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 the fabulous experiment of Hubel and Weasel, which shows that um, when you get to V1, you get orientation selective cells, which can be interpreted to have been built up from the center surround cells of the retina and the LGM. So if you shine a light on the excitatory centers, you would get cells which will respond to this orientation. And that's a kind of hierarchy. And then if you have several orientation selective cells converging onto a further cell, a complex cell, you would get a cell that responds to this orientation, but over a larger part of the field of view. And then if you invoke both excitation and inhibition, you can get a cell that responds to a line which is stopped. So it receives an excitatory uh, input from a cell with this orientation and this receptive field, and inhibitory input from cells with this orientation and these uh, uh, receptive fields. So excitation here, inhibition here, gives you what they call the hypercomplex cell, but which we now refer to as a end stop cell. So let us not throw away these findings, but incorporate them and ask ourselves, uh, th this, is, this happens, but what contribution, what contribution uh, does the uh, direct input to the LGN to these form areas, which bypass V1, what contribution do they make? And by the way, there is good evidence that um, there is not one form system, but there are at least three different form systems. A form from motion, form from form, form from color, and also form from shading. And it is unreasonable to expect they all operate along identical lines. In the motion system, uh, uh, Tony Moffshin and his colleagues, Bill Newsom and Simon Celli, have shown that the cells in V1, if you have got a, a plaid like that moving in this direction, the cells, the orientation selective cells in V1, will respond to the component, this direction and this direction and hence cannot detect the real motion of the object, where the cells in V5 can detect its real direction. Again, a hierarchical uh, organization. These are very, very important, essential findings in the history of our subjects, and I do not mean to, to suggest for a moment that they should be um, revised. It's only that the, what the input from um, the LGN to V5, for example, what role it plays in elaborating the properties of cells in V5, in addition to the role that the input from V1 to V5 plays. So, <clears throat> we can reach the conclusion that there are multiple hierarchical systems in the visual brain acting in parallel. So it's no longer a fight between is the brain organized in parallel or in hierarchical fashion, but it is that there are multiple hierarchically organized parallel systems. So we're incorporating the parallel and the hierarchical. I cannot resist, I cannot resist telling, quoting to you from a um, uh, famous, uh, I can't remember his name now, who is the man who wrote, who, who wrote Perceptrons? Do you know? Wrote what? Perceptrons. Perceptrons? Um, Rosenbach. No, no, there's another name. Or modularity of mind, modularity of mind? Modularity of yes, okay. Uh, one of those, uh, um, in fact, says, I mean, we understood parallel processing systems and their importance before the computer technologists understood it. And further, I think, was who said that they had not understood it in the 1970s. We, we, our things were published in the early 70s because they did not understand the power of parallel computers. So it is perhaps reasonable to pay some attention to discoveries in anatomy. So, now, there are multiple, then, uh, uh, three, at least three feed-forward systems, each one composed of hierarchy, so there are several parallel hierarchical systems. The precedence which one hierarchical system has over other parallel hierarchical systems is stimulus and task dependent. Now, asynchronous processing within an area so, if you um, 
agree, and I think there's no reason why you should not, that a single area receives inputs asynchronously, depending upon the stimulus. It is unreasonable to suppose that that area will wait there until all the other signals reach it, because it does not know what other signals are going to reach it. I mean, it can be any of the fast signals, all right? So it will start processing signals as soon as they reach it. That is a reasonable assumption. So if you have got an area such as V5, it receives signals from slow, uh, uh, from fast moving uh, stimuli, from slow moving stimuli, and for uh, structures which are in motion. It processes them at different speeds. We know that there's a difference of six milliseconds between the processing of these stimuli in V, uh, uh, between the processing of these stimuli and these stimuli. This is from the work of uh, Tony Motion. And so the signals reach these areas at different times, and it is reasonable to suppose that they are processed at different times because this area will process signals as they reach it, and therefore the outputs from it will also be at different times. Hence, if different signals are processed asynchronously within an area, then it becomes likely that the outputs from it are asynchronous too, because if an area finishes processing uh, the signal, and indeed it seems to be able to finish processing of fast motion signals before slow motion mo uh, processing ones, why should it wait? For slow, mo processing, uh, for slow motion signals, which may never arrive. So the output from it will be asynchronous too. And uh, here we go, asynchronous input. And uh, if the outputs from it are asynchronous, it becomes reasonable to suppose that the re return inputs to it are asynchronous as well, because it is now understood that there is every area which connects to another area receives a reciprocal input back uh, from these areas. And hence, you would expect that the return inputs to these areas will also be, oops, I'm sorry. These are my attempts at doing these things which are not terribly good, just illustrated. So, so asynchrony becomes a very, very fundamental uh, concept in my book, in the operations of the brain, and it is something which I think which it's mandatory, really, to incorporate it into computational models of how the visual brain operates. Now, the computer people are already doing it. They're taking it seriously, and there have been one or two papers recently. They've not had great success, nothing like the success of the brain, but they are trying it. So let us look at the conclusions that we can reach from all of this. First, that there are at least three parallel hierarchical systems reaching V1 and the visual areas. Hence, that V1 is the only feed-forward system in, into the visual brain must be revised. It must be revised. If you don't want to revise, that's fine, but your series will be outdated very soon. Um, secondly, that the view that pre-processing by V1 or post-processing by it is mandatory for conscious vision must be revisited. These are the theories of Ahisar, the theory of Lame, uh, and Rolfsommer, and others, that, and, and, and also was uh, of Weisskrantz, but he's changed his mind, that signals must be pre-processed by V1 before they can reach the conscious stage. That is not true for the evidence I gave you, that signals reaching V5 directly and V4 directly can elicit a conscious visible percept of motion, fast motion and of color. Thirdly, that the operations of the visual brain are massively asynchronous, a fact which must be taken into account in future computational models of how the visual brain operates. And finally, that because of the brain's asynchronous operations, activity in some visual areas acquires a conscious correlate, a microconsciousness, before activity in other areas does so. And maybe there is one more. Um, uh, which of the parallel hierarchical systems has temporal precedence over the others? An activity in which of the parallel hierarchical systems has perceptual precedence depends upon the stimulus and task. STTH, stimulus and task dependent hierarchies. So you cannot predict, you cannot predict the perceptual hierarchies from the latency of arrival of signals. 
you cannot predict the latency of arrival of signals from the anatomical hierarchies, but you can predict all of these if you say that there are multiple parallel hierarchies uh, the, uh, and activity in each one of them is dependent upon task and stimulus, which determines the perceptual precedence that one has over the other. So that is, it is now 10 o'clock, one minute past. That is the summary of uh, uh, what I want to say to you. And it seems to me that it's reasonable to, to expect that we should take, most of these are facts. I, I did not uh, uh, speculate. The only speculations I have in this talk is that the outputs and the return inputs must be asynchronous. The rest of it is not speculation, it's the facts. It seems to me that it is time that these facts are incorporated in new computational uh, uh, theories of how the visual brain operates. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, question time. <coughs> yes, please. So, um, what would be the evolutionary reason why okay. you would have this okay. color, then motion? Let me, let me, let me uh, uh, yeah, answer this question. I, I just finished the paper and just uh, fresh in my mind. Oh, okay. is, it, is it still working? Yes. Uh, look, the, uh, if you have to accept, first of all, there's one fact you have to accept, which is shown, that the processing time for uh, motion is slower than for color. That's why I see color first. Okay. So what is the uh, and 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 the color system does not wait for the motion system to, to complete its task. That's why you misbind. So what is the advantage of not waiting? That is the question. And the advantage of not waiting is as follows: Supposing you are uh, supposing an animal. Is, uh, uh, is, has got a prey. Let's say it's a uh, yellow deer running in different directions. It will be able to trace it by its color, by its direction of motion, or by its form. Now, if it has to bring all three together, it will be at a temporal disadvantage than if it can do it by one alone. Right? Admittedly, it's only 80 milliseconds, but 80 milliseconds is a long time. So there are considerable advantages in being able to determine the, uh, an object by one of its many attributes. And uh, you can see that if you have two computers, two computers, one which has to determine the uh, object by looking at all three attributes in combination, it will be at a probabilistic disadvantage compared to a computer that can determine one uh, the same object by one attribute. Other questions? Well, so, um, <clears throat> so you not distinguish two input pathways, right? One over the LGN, the other one over the Pulvenar. So, mm. Pulvenar also has been associated with attention, for instance. Mm -hmm. okay. So, do you see that as another component of that secondary pathway? Pulvenar pathway, that it also already has more, let's say, a task-oriented filtering of input as yes. opposed to the LGN pathway. So what is special now about this, this Pulvenar-dependent pathway? I, I really don't know, but I think I, I go along with the fact, as the work of stewardship, that this is much more uh, um, concerned with attention. Mm -hmm. But it, it probably filters attention in, in the sense that this is a moving thing, this is a, because it, 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 it feeds into all these areas. I think there is some work, I cannot remember the name of the, of the people at NIH, who have shown that it is more likely that the motion properties of V5 are conferred by the LGN input, not the pulvenar, and probably is likely that the attentional ones are, are provided by uh, the pulvenar. Right. But then in that sense, it might not really be a parallel pathway because there's still interdependencies in that case. Like for in the motion case. Well, I mean, there is no there is no pathway which is not dependent upon other pathways. They're all interdependent, but they are parallel anatomically. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very, very distinct anatomically. You can uh, work them out anatomically. Sure, of course. And also, I mean, the, the input from the LGN uh, to the, the specialized areas is extremely distinct from the uh, input from, the, from V1. Mm -hmm. It comes from the intercalated layers rather than oh. the uh, laminae themselves. Okay. But then, uh, if you now look at this, this, uh, the latency differences between color and motion processing, mm -hmm. right? You could argue that in some sense, if I want to estimate motion, that is a higher level problem than estimating shape. Because if I don't know which shape I'm actually tracking, I cannot estimate its motion, right? So for mm -hmm. form-based perception, there's also already a hierarchy and a set of dependencies in the processing that you have to perform. So in that sense, you could argue that it's unreasonable to assume that motion estimation has to happen in parallel and partially independent of form perception, but you're obviously not not subscribing to that view, right? So mm -hmm. why would you why would you see these as really independent processing streams? Because some you you then, you then sort of postpone the problem. Like if I have to isolate the motion with microphone, I first have to determine what's a microphone at all, and then I have to. No, you don't. No, you don't. No. Okay. You can you can determine that something is in motion, but your question is is is, is an important one. Um, look, there are two or three reasons. One is that um, I think this was uh, Immanuel Kant who emphasized this, uh, and there's a sign of interdisciplinarity here, um, that, that uh, events and objects do not co-occur necessarily in nature. I mean, uh, uh, it's not true that a red bus will always move to the right. If, it, if this were so, then you could identify the bus either by its form or by its color or by its direction of motion, but it's not, that's not the case. Uh, red can invest any object, and any object can move in any direction. So you've got these three independent variables, which one reason which, which they, why they must be independently represented, we think. Another one, but these are conjectures, another one is the fact that the computational requirements for constructing colors is significantly different from that for constructing uh, form, uh, motion. So for color, you have got to look at the wavelength composition of light coming from one area and from surrounding areas simultaneously, to take ratios. And for motion, you've got to look at two points successively in time. All right? So the computational requirements are quite different. For form, you have to look at the relations of different parts to determine what, which you don't have to do for color. Wait, but, but I don't think this is enough, because uh -huh. I, could, I could now follow a gestalt, a gestalt approach and say, oh, wait one moment. You're actually using motion to get to the shape because common motion gives me an indication of where, let's say, the boundaries are of shapes. Once I've done that, I can now start to integrate across motion cues that might be of different modalities to give me now an estimate of the average motion of that shape as an object. Right? Well, so there are two levels of motion processing here that might serve two different purposes. And then in your that, analysis, yeah. Right, the motion processing would feed into the form detection first. Well, right. uh, I mean, there are good examples of clinical subjects who can see static forms, but not forms in motion. Mm -hmm. But others who cannot see the static forms, but can see them when they're set in motion. So I think that there is a separation between the two. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I do not deny, uh, by the way, that, that uh, Obviously, in the, in the, in the uh, intact brain, these all help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're, we're breaking it down to its bare bones to build sure. it up again. OK. Yes, please. Hi, thanks a lot for your talk. Very interesting. And I wanted to ask whether you know, but because you said some people are working on somehow refining computational theories based on these findings. Yeah. And my question would be other people who try to, f what you just sort of talked about, that the computational requirements differ for color processing and form and, and things like that. Because as far as I know, it's very hard to do that platform independent. Like when you don't know what you're computing with, whether you can write a general theory that captures the computational difficulty of, of recognizing color or do you know what I, what I mean yes but 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 the the, the, the requirements for computing uh, well not computing constructing colors because then you don't compute because there are no colors in the world outside you you construct them in the in the brain the requirements for constructing colors are very well established um, not physiologically but perceptually so what you do 
is you need a surface which reflects given amounts of light of any wave band, and the surround, which reflects different amounts of light of the same wave band, and you take the ratios between them, and these ratios never change. Uh, the subject of color vision has been largely dominated by Newtonian optics. What do I mean by that? I mean using a reduction screen, looking at a color in a, as a patch, everything else obscured. Right? And that leads to a different set of equations, which has been very useful for in, it, in the uh, trichromatic theory of vision in, in doing, uh, uh, working out retinal anomalies but does not at all address the question of what happens in the cerebral cortex. And I think most, most uh, computer programs rely on the latter, although I'm not an authority on the subject. Now, just ask yourself, what happens to a system which relies, to a computer system that relies on the, com on the Newtonian system? the color of an object will change with every change in the wavelength composition of the light. Therefore, you, uh, color would no longer be a good recognition system. In the land cortical system, the colors are always stable. One of the functions of the brain is to acquire knowledge about the world. And the only way of acquiring knowledge about the world is to stabilize it. And the computations in color is one way of stabilizing the world to obtain knowledge about it. Okay, so thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. And, uh, but I was wondering what parameters of the motion do you think are most important in this differentiation between color processing and motion processing? So for instance, the speed or the acceleration of I movement, because in your example with the metronome, the motion was constant, the speed was constant, but I was wondering if, for instance, an object would just start moving. It was static before ah. and it just starts moving now. Would yes. that be processed at the same speed yeah, no. as if the uh, object you. would just change color? Yeah. That's another interesting question, and, and, and also the one reason why I say that it's task dependent, because if the task that you give is not what was the color when it was moving to the right, but uh, when did the color change, forget what change it was, but when did the color change and when did the direction of motion change, then you get zero difference. All right? So that the task now has changed completely, and you're working out a different parameter. Okay. That's another reason uh, why I say that it is task dependent. So, so, so you had you had uh, people. Uh, we published these results in 1997, and then uh, various people confirmed it, and then somebody published this result, which I've just told you about, as if it was a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. It's just, it's a different task. So, would you say you, if you have one object that is static? Yes color, either changes color or starts moving, would you say that uh, what event would be detected first? Yeah, both will be detected at first the same time. If, if you do not ask the subject to tell you which direction it was moving in or what color it has changed into. If you say, have the two changed at the same time, he will tell you yes. Mm -hmm. All right. But you. once you ask the color and direction of motion, then you get the precedence. Thank you for your lecture. It was really nice and it gave me some wonderful ideas for my research as well. Thank you. My question is related to some evolutionary aspects related to fear processing. To, to what processing? Uh, fear processing. Fear? Yeah. And the thing is that you talked about uh, that the colors are perceived faster than movements. It totally fits in the scenario. But the thing is, I read a research uh, from Miss Elizabeth Alalavas that I am um, blind but I see fear. People with uh, visual extinction and blind sight can process fearful postures or information related to fear because uh, of the subcortical pathways that process the information. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, um, you told that um, um, stimulus perceived at 80 milliseconds, uh, the thing are, I think, um, of very low resolution and are processed by the subcortical system and not the cortical system. And uh, it leads to the activation of amygdala. But even in cases... Uh, activation uh, of? Uh, amygdala. Amygdala. And the thing is, you told that uh, V5, uh, in addition to V1, V5, V4 regions are necessary for conscious perception 
of the visual stimulus? Yes. And uh, the thing is, uh, how does this w that works in the fear processing? Because the stimulus of 80 milliseconds is too s short for like cortical to be identified by the cortical uh, process. Uh, are you saying that the stimulus reaches the amygdala in 80 milliseconds? No, no, no. It's it passes through the subcortical yes. systems. Well, you see, uh, that is another another uh, thing which is, which is which is well. Uh, it's a very interesting point you bring up. I have done experiments which has been published only in an abstract form. I've never pursued them. You see the expression on a face about 40 milliseconds before you see the identity of a face. And that makes sense. I mean, when you come into my room smiling, then I know that you're happy. <laughs> I, can, I can approach you in a different way than if you come into my room growling. The, uh, the, the fact that signals reach the amygdala Without passing through V1, this is something which Joe Ledoux, I think, came up with, or maybe it's others, but he certainly uh, uh, made it uh, more popular, is a fact which is, is entirely consistent with everything I was uh, saying to you, uh, that different features may be rooted in different ways. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the role of the amygdala in, in fear, um, well, the... the, the, the the, the fact that you see a face holistically, including the fear or the, uh, the expression, is simply not true. You see them at different times. Did, did I answer your question, or did I not? I get the impression that I did not. He wants you to solve his project. No, 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 it's <laughs> not that. I would be very happy. I'm here to do that. It's not that. Um, <laughs> I am working on a project related to fear processing and how it can be helpful in cases of traumatic brain injury. And I would be presenting an abstract in the Nature Conference later this year. But the thing is, um, I, I will ask you later regarding this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that that'll we know me time. Give is, me time. let's take in auditory processing, for instance, you can observe extremely short responses yes. in amygdala, about yes. 10, 15 milliseconds, yeah. right, in, in conditioning. Uh, and these stem from direct projections from MGN, so it's the, the auditory thalamic nucleus. And similar things have been observed also in visual processing and processing of emotional expression or monkey faces in, in macaque monkey, right? So you can mm -hmm. see these subcortical processing pathways converging on the amygdala mm -hmm. will give you very short latency responses that completely bypass further mm -hmm. cortical processing, okay? So that's consistent with what you're having in mind. Do we have other questions? Ah, Sok. By the way, if, if I may just say that, that if, if I've been uh, not very explicit in some things, I, 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 this is uh, self-publicizing, but, but I think among friends one can do that. Uh, I, I reviewed all this in a paper which appeared only two months ago in the European Journal of Neuroscience. So if you want to, there are details you can fill in from the. Hi, thanks for the talk. So uh, you're mentioning particularly that um, the, these parallel processing occurs very much task dependently. Yes. So could you hypothesize perhaps what is the part of the brain that triggers this selection of either of, either of the processes to choose from, depending on the task, and how does it create this switch yes. in the brain? Yes. Well, I mean, this is a very broad question. I mean, th there is no doubt that the uh, brain areas can make a selection, and I'll come back to that in a moment. It's a very, very critical question that you're asking, which has not been addressed properly. But the um, question on how the brain selects, uh, I think in this case is that it depends upon what signals arrive first. I mean, there is no question of, of uh, uh, if, if you deliver signals to the amygdala first, when you see a fearful child, and that is the dominant one, but that's dependent upon the stimulus. Now, on the question of what areas, uh, how the brain selects, it is a cardinal, cardinal question in neurobiology which has not been properly addressed, and I'll give you an example of that. The, the, uh, there are areas of the brain that are important for the recognition of human bodies. It's been done by Downing and others in, in Wales. If you show people, don't tell the research councils this because they will not give you the money, but I can tell you the evidence is there. If you show people 
the bodies of faces which they rate as very ugly, all right? You have activity in the primary visual cortex in the body areas, but also activity in the amygdala. If you show them pictures of the same gender faces, but uh, uh, bodies, but very beautiful, you have activity in V1 in the body areas, but then activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex, activity in which always correlates with the experience of beauty. So somewhere between V1 and these areas, there is some kind of selection processing taking place with channel signals into one area or another. Now, why is this? This is the best known example that I know of, anyway. Now, why is this important? Because there is no area of the cerebral cortex, none, which has got an output to one other area only. They all have outputs to multiple areas, usually upwards of a dozen. So the question that you want to ask, are all these outputs activated when this area undertakes a particular task, or are they activated only on a need-to-know basis? So this is a very important question. But I don't have a, 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 an answer to what the selective process is. Well, I mean, we can discuss about it later, because I do have some ideas, but it's very speculative. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, this is more an anatomical question. Yes. Uh, do you know if there is uh, already any evidence, or do you have any hint on whether the, these parallel inputs uh, from the LGN to the, the different visual areas um, convey the same kind of information or really provide different types of information to each of the different areas? Well, yes. I mean, uh, the, 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 it, is, it is now, I think, fairly well established that the input from the LGN to, the, uh, to V5 deals mainly with fast motion. And indeed, it's becoming increasingly apparent that V5 itself is not only, excuse me, not only specialized for motion, but for fast motion. And the evidence for this comes partly from the, what I've told you today, but partly from what I've not told you. If you have a subject with a lesion in V1, but not in V5, they can see fast motion, but not slow motion. I've shown you that. But if you have a subject with a lesion in V5, this is a subject of Giuseppe Ziel in, in Austria, uh, uh, in Munich, sorry. Um, if, you have, if you have a subject with a lesion in V5, they can see very slow motion, the one mediated through V1, but they cannot see fast motion. Anything up above 20 milliseconds, 20 degrees per second, they cannot see. Now, in addition to that, the projections from the LGN to V4 do not come from the from the um, uh, from there's four six uh, I forget them now do not come from the from the from the uh, uh, p layers the parvocellular layers uniquely they come from the intercalated layers and the intercalated layers according to the work of Henry and of various other people not mine um, uh, contain cells which are more sensitive in the blue region of the spectrum. So there is an anatomical difference coupled to a functional difference. Yeah. Uh, so you are defending how this uh, basic hierarchical structure is modulated functionally or stimulus dependent, but what, what are the mechanisms? Are any, any hint, or are, are there cases in which patients that fail to modulate this uh, functionally, the, the, so patients in which these differences in latency are not task dependent or fail to have this? Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I haven't come encountered that at all, but, but what I've just told you, the, the, the patient who's got a lesion V1, the only <laughs> motion task that he can do is fast motion. That's the only one he can do. But he gets it right. Uh, so, so the phenomenon of blindsight, incidentally, is a phenomenon which I don't believe in at all. I call it the Riddick syndrome in honor of the man who first described it in 1917. If you get a lesion in V5, uh, Zill's patient, then they cannot do fast motion at all. They can only do slow motion. So here are two examples in which uh, their, their um, 
capacities, their conscious capacities, are restricted to the pathways and the physiology that serve the area. The evidence for the motion system is far ahead uh, compared to the color and the form system. And the color and the form system people are still living in the age when they think that all the signals are channeled through V1. That's one of the problems. Other questions? So then maybe a last one. <clears throat> in some sense, you solve one binding problem, partially, let's say the spatial binding problem, but now you create a new binding problem in time because now we're looking at an asynchronous processing hierarchy yes. or a dual processing hierarchy that are asynchronous. So now somewhere down the line, the bug has to stop and you have to integrate. Yes. Okay. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, let me say that I am, uh, uh, I, I am uh, e e ever since I described the neural correlates of the experience of mathematical beauty, I have become completely uh, mesmerized by theories uh, in theoretical physics and in mathematics. In theoretical physics, the question, uh, if, if I may, because this is quite interesting. Now, here is real interdisciplinarity, but don't tell the research council or the journals because they will throw you out. Uh, in theoretical physics, the problem, the main problem is how do you account for quantum theory in terms of uh, the uh, gravitational theory of uh, uh, Newton and Einstein. One is smooth, the other one is granular. In quantum uh, uh, mechanics and particle physics, a particle can appear in two places at once, or it can go from one place to the other without going in between. This doesn't make sense. As uh, Niels Bohr said, if you are not shocked by quantum theory, it means you have not understood it. Now, it has not stopped physicists developing fantastic uh, uh, theories and things in other fields. And of course, quantum mechanics has been used for lasers, for CDs, and, and so on. Um, where the problem arises is if you go project backwards in time, when the whole of the universe was supposed to be a particle the size, a millionth of a millionth of the size of an atom where you would expect quantum mechanics to work, but it leads to gravitational physics, and this does not clear. Now, in the same way, I think that the, 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 uh, the, the micro-perception is quite coherent. You see what some things before you see others. macro consciousness is also quite coherent, uh, in that you do get binding. Now, the question arises is, where do they converge? My own view, let me say without offending anyone, because I don't mean to, there are lots of very brilliant experiments which have been done on binding, but I think it is true today to say that we do not have a definitive answer to how binding occurs. And my view is that there must be coincidence detectors, possibly in the hippocampus, which say that these two events occurred within the same theta wave or gamma wave, whatever, and therefore they belong to the same thing. But this is a theory. But that, that does imply that you would tolerate some form of clocking then of the system, because then you would have a slow oscillatory dynamic. Some form right? of, uh, uh, yes, in the, in the longer term, yes, some form mm -hmm. of clocking, yes. OK, so that would be, let's say, a hybrid, a hybrid mode of sort of a pseudo clocking within which asynchronous events right. get selected. Right. OK, right. very right. good. Well, um, Samir Zeki, thank you very much for this okay. presentation. Um, Samir will, will be will be around for uh, for more of your questions if you have any, and uh, I think now we're heading towards our coffee break. Okay, coffee break, poster session, and then do we come back in this space? All right. So uh, for those who haven't participated in BCD before, uh, we're going to have a common lunch. Um, so don't miss out. All right. So. 3.30, we reconvene here after coffee, poster, lunch, and whatever else you plan to do. Yeah? All right, thank you. See you later. <laughs>